Hello and welcome. Thank you to everyone joining us online and here at the new Parkway Theater in Oakland, California. I'm Ariana Rivera Lee, and I'm the Senior Programs Coordinator at Zocalo Public Square, a unit of Arizona State University Media Enterprise. At Zocalo, our mission is to connect people to ideas and to each other. Everything we do is free and everyone is welcome. We publish original writing and present conversations like this one. You can find us at ZocaloPublicSquare.org, on podcast platforms, and YouTube. So please subscribe for our latest programs. We were founded in 2003 and are now celebrating our 20th year. Tonight, we present the fifth program in our series, What is a Good Job Now? Supported by the James Irvine Foundation focusing on workers in the low-wage sectors of California's economy in communities across the state. Through public programs and essays grounded in workers' experiences and realities, we explore how to make the hardest jobs more rewarding and may make life easier for those who do them. This evening, we continue the series with What is a Good Job Now in Gig Work? I'm pleased to introduce our moderator, Levy Sumagaisai. Levy reports on the California economy for Cal Matters with an eye on accountability and equity issues. A longtime technology and business reporter and editor, she has followed and covered the rise of the app based gig economy since the founding of Uber and the ways tech has changed our lives since the founding of the dot coms and through Silicon Valley's booms and busts. She previously worked at MarketWatch and more, for more than two decades at the Mercury News. A first-generation immigrant, Levy has lived in the Bay Area since the 1980s. Levy, over to you. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone. I'm Levi Sumagaisai and I'm a reporter at Cal Matters. Um, I'm pleased to introduce our guests tonight. We have Sergio Avedian, who has his rich six year tenure as a senior contributor for the Rideshare Guy. He's a seasoned expert in major gig platforms like Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, Grubhub, and Instacart. He's widely recognized in the field he serves as a consultant and has been quoted in publications such as CNBC, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal. I used to quote him at MarketWatch. As the host of the popular live stream and podcast Show Me the Money Club on Rideshare Guy's YouTube channel, he passionately advocates for gig workers. Prior to his roles in consulting and content creation, he dedicated two decades as a senior VP at Prudential Securities specializing in equities and deriv derivatives trading. He remains an active driver and consumer on various gig platforms. Sergio, it's nice to have you here. Thank you. We also have Alan Narciss. He is the CEO and founder of Gigs. He is redefining marketplace connections between job seekers and employers through innovation. With a background in the rideshare industry, including leading roles at Uber Eats and Lyft, and as chief operating officer of WorkRise, a leading labor marketplace, he's a proven strategist. An alum of the University of Michigan and Harvard Business School, he is originally from Iowa and now lives in LA and champions access to opportunity. Hi, Alan. Thank you. And lastly, we have Shelly Stewart. She is a sociologist focused on work and technology. She applies participatory action methods, engaging and empowering workers as researchers to study the changing nature of work. As chief research officer at the Workers Lab, she is building a particip participatory action research center. She is the former director of the Aspen Institute Future of Work Initiative and was a postdoctoral researcher with the Fair Work Project based at the Oxford Internet Institute. She has a PhD from, the, from UC Berkeley 
and an AB from Harvard. And before becoming a sociologist, she was a middle school science teacher. Welcome, Shelley. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I'd like to remind our audience that we'll be taking questions toward the end of the program. And if you're watching online, you can submit questions to the live chat on YouTube. And with that, let's get started. Um, I want to start off by acknowledging that there are all kinds of gig work. Um, Uber did not invent freelancing. Um, you know, contract work existed before Uber was founded. Um, but what Uber did popularize was on-demand work, usually controlled by an app, right? Um, so with that, I want to throw it to Alan, because you are CEO of Gigs. And I'd like to ask you what kind of gigs are found on your platform and how they're different from you know, what we now know as, as gig work. So uh, my platform gigs has full-time, part-time, and gig jobs. About 90% of our jobs are cashier roles, barista roles, uh, delivery driver roles. But we also have roles from Uber, Lyft, DoorDash. Um, the idea is that we want to have every earning opportunity that a job seeker might seek. If they're entry level, if they need flexibility, if they're trying to gain experience, if they're trying to discover what type of opportunity they're going to pursue. Mm -hmm. um, and so we focus in on the 86 million blue collar workers in the United States and all the opportunities that they might seek. Got it. Um, and are people able to find um, actual employment and not gigs on right. the platform? Right. So you'll, you'll see brands that you would expect, Ralph's, Starbucks, uh, where you can have uniform W-2 style roles, um, where you apply for that job and you become an employee of record for that company. Mm -hmm. um, you can also see fractional roles like delivery drivers, rideshare drivers, um, with a gig style kind of company as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we interchange those. Our job seekers want all the different types of opportunities and they want to be able to compare those types of jobs. Uh, and so that's why we have both traditional jobs, job jobs, mm -hmm. uh, as well as gig opportunities. Got it. Um, Shelly, I want to turn to you and ask you about um, what you think the biggest change has been to the nature of work with the rise of gig jobs like Uber, DoorDash, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, building off of how, Alan, you described gigs, what you're describing is work. Some of it's arranged via an app. Some of it is not arranged via an app. Some of it's full-time, some of it's part-time. And that, that's work. And that is how people work and have worked for a very long time. Uh, I think we have this idea, or we often talk about this idea of traditional work and have this vision of a full-time career at one employer with a pension at the end. And we hold that up as traditional, but it's not. It was never the norm. It was the norm for white men during a couple decades in the middle of one century. And in reality, people have always been piecing together different work. Many people have been excluded from systems of benefits, of social protections, of labor protections, often on the basis of race, gender, disability, immigration status. And that's what's still true today. So I know you're, you're throwing me a question about change, and what I'm highlighting is how things have kind of stayed the same. Uh, what some of the recent technological developments have done is bring attention to a lot of these issues, brought visibility to the work and workers, and also potential for some of the agency and choice over time, which is what we hear workers wanting, no matter how they're working. Uh, and there's all sorts of problems and exploitation that I'm sure we'll get into, uh, but there also is a lot of potential. And that's, that's what gives me hope about how things are changing. So that brings me to you, Sergio. Um, you know, like Shelley said, there is hope and opportunity with gig work. Certainly. But also, obviously, problems, issues, concerns, which you and I have talked about this a lot. We hear 
about that from a lot of gig workers. So what would you say are the top two concerns that you hear about from fellow Uber and Lyft drivers like yourself? Yeah, first I want to thank you for moderating um, this panel. Uh, thank you Zocalo and uh, James Irvine Foundation for putting this wonderful event together. And thank you for all my brothers and sisters on wheels. I don't know you, but I'm sure you know me. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, look, complaining is obviously there, right? It's part of my job. I listen to a lot of complaining actually. And, uh, you know, we even have a union in our channel. We call Complainers Drivers United. That's what we do. We just listen to complaints. But the complaints have been the same for the last, at, you know, at least three to four years, which is earnings. Mm -hmm. And there is like three or four actually complaints, major complaints. One is earnings. Second one is safety, safety of drivers. And that doesn't, the day does not go by that you don't read in the news that some rideshare driver got you know, carjacked or shot or killed, unfortunately, or a delivery driver. Uh, number three is unjust deactivations, basically getting fired by an AI bot, which did not exist in the traditional world, right? There is HR departments, you know, you can complain, you can go to your labor department, and you can file a complaint, but today, you know, things have changed via the apps, right? A, a, a writer or a food delivery consumer will complain, and sure enough, within 10 minutes, you'll be off the platform and then your livelihood will be at stake. So, you know, there are things that obviously that are not correct, but then there are also good things with the gig economy. I mean, I, I do hear a lot of good stuff. A lot of drivers um, are driving, making some money. I mean, I don't know if they're profitable these days or not, but, you know, it, it's an opportunity to earn income, to put food on their table and to pay their rent. So it's not all bad. I mean, are they things to fix? Absolutely, and we're going to try to fix it. And then, but there are good things and there are bad things. And but apps definitely have changed the workspace for sure. Yeah. Well, one thing I do want to ask you because you, uh, despite your celebrity, um, <laughs> you still drive, right? Absolutely. Why do you do it, and why do your friends do it? Okay, I first of all, I started with Uber in 2016, and about six months later, I joined Lyft. Now I'm on eight different apps, all right? Wow. So the reason I multi-app or do it is because I'm kind of basically forced to do it that way, right? Because I, initially for six months when I was on Uber, I could literally make 60 bucks an hour when I first started. Mm -hmm. And that's like master plumber money, who's going to work with his tools. Well, I'm taking my tool to work, which is my car. Um, but over time, you know, earnings have diminished. I mean, and, and obviously, with scale, certain other problems showed up, but nowadays what I'm trying to do is to keep my nose on the street. To, because I can talk to an Alan, CEO of a company, or talk to Dara Koshoshari, who was the CEO of Lyft, and tomorrow I'm gonna be talking to David Risher, right. right? And these are CEOs of companies. I can put myself in their shoes, and I want them to put themselves in our shoes with the pressure that drivers face. So I want to feel that pressure. I want to pay my rent. I want to pay my bills with that pressure, you know. And that's why I drive and I enjoy driving. I mean, I enjoy meeting people. I, I've been in LA for 30 years. I've been to places that I don't even know through rideshare. So, you know, it's a fun thing to do. Um, but that's why I keep doing it. So from a very top down look I have, right, I can talk to the CEOs, but I'm also a driver feeling the pain that's on the streets. Alan, um, why do you think people are turning to gigs to find work? Well, I was just going to say, um, based on what Sergio said before, the, one of the driver issues that I heard and some of the issues I hear from job seekers now is really this problem of earnings consistency. Right. Uh, you need to pay rent, you need to pay for your car, childcare, Pay has to be dependable for you to feel stable. Right. Uh, and so I, that's an issue with gig jobs. I think it's also an issue with full-time jobs and part-time jobs. Um, from respect of retail jobs, maybe giving you fewer and fewer hours each week, mm -hmm. not knowing what your schedule will be, uh, and not having that earnings stability that you need. Um, and so I think one trend that, that I'm seeing uh, from the data in my business uh, is that the issues that gig drivers have uh, Part-time workers and full-time drivers are also are, uh, workers are also having it uh, in non-gig type uh, structures as well. But I, mean, I agree. Sorry, I agree okay. with what Alan is, is. You know, earnings 
And, and today's earnings are algorithmically either limited or, or, I mean, there are algorithms out there. And these companies, it's no surprise, right? After 10 years of losing money, and Uber has turned profitable for the last two quarters in a row. Mm -hmm. Why? That's because the algorithms are charging as much as they can with certain elasticity to the rider or the consumer and pay as little as they can, and they're doing a wonderful job at it. Now, does that benefit the driver? Probably not as much, but it seems like the even, you know, I even heard, and we made a joke about it, like Wendy's was, was going to use dynamic pricing now on right. the burgers. Right, right. I'm like, I'm boycotting Wendy's for the next decade <laughs> because I don't think dynamic pricing applies to burgers. But long, <laughs> joking aside, you know, earnings have been kind of controlled by algorithms. And, you know, we talked about it, algorithmic wage discrimination, all these good things. And it seems like it's infiltrating a lot of other um, regular work, basically. That's what people are doing, on-demand work. Yeah. And, and there's not surge pay for workers. Right. Yeah, exactly. Either, exactly. So, yeah. so Shelly, yeah, I, I want to throw it to you. Um, let's talk about that. So one of the things that Alan said was um, there are people who want part-time work, <laughs> right, or want to be able to work when they can. But there's a difference. If you're working for Uber versus what when you're working for a company part-time as an employee. Can you talk about the difference, Shelley? Yeah, there's, you know, there's differences that are in the classification of the worker. Right. Is a worker an employee with certain benefits and protections mandated by law, sometimes enforced, sometimes not, uh, versus an independent contractor who has control over their work environment, uh, and with that, do not have the same benefits and protections. There's been a lot of political controversy around the status specifically of delivery, drive, delivery and rideshare drivers uh, who are classified as independent contractors, uh, but have many aspects of their work controlled by the companies. Uh, so you know, when, we, when we look at this and when we talk to rideshare drivers and, and other app-based gig workers, uh, what, what matters is the conditions that they're facing. And this goes to, you know, what both Alan and Sergio were saying, that this work fits into this broader context where both W-2 employment and gig rideshare independent contracting work is suffering a job quality problem. There's low wages, there's not enough shifts to go around, whether those are workers choosing them or being assigned to them. And so you have this situation where people have really bad W-2 jobs, and so they turn to bad rideshare jobs to try to make a living. And then we have these conversations that are like, well, how do we make one better? But really, we need to lift the floor for all of that work so that it's all decently paid work that gives workers some agency and control in their lives. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, this is so timely, actually, what we're doing today. Uh, you know, with the Department of Labor's federal ruling went into effect on January, I mean, March 11, two days ago. Mm -hmm. What has changed? The apps are still around. We can still turn our apps. We're not employees yet, right? And there is this misclassification battle that's been going on for a long, long time, right? right? And in cities, what's happening in Minneapolis now, you know, and the drivers finally passed something that's beneficial to them, and Uber and Lyft are threatening to leave. So... To, to me, this, this battle has been going on for really, really too long. And the, the base problem is earnings, earnings, earnings. We'd, we've been doing surveys at the Rideshare Guy for years. It's always been earnings, top of the list, right? right. And, and uh, I mean, not all, all these people are not lying. There's got to be some reality to it, right? And, but, yeah, and I think, yeah, this is awesome that we're doing this today. Yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead, Al. I was, was going to say, just to add to what you're saying, when I worked in rideshare, one statistic I heard was often is that 80% of drivers had full-time jobs. Yep. I, I always thought of that as a classification issue when I was working in the industry, but now I think of that as why do so many full-time workers need gig jobs on top of a full-time yep. job? Mm -hmm. it and it's really this earnings consistency. Horrible full-time job they have probably. Yeah. And you know, actually, somebody asked me here, I was getting interviewed, and they said, would you, do ride share, would you advise a new driver to do rideshare today? And we're a rideshare channel. I said flat out, no. Mm -hmm. Right? Why did I say that? 
it's because the risks we're taking to drive people around. I mean, look, what did our parents tell us? Don't get in a car with a stranger. <laughs> well, we're doing that as a driver 30 right. times a day, yeah. literally. Yeah. Right? yeah. We don't know who's, like, and the other thing is the reason we talk about safety as driver communities, the rider knows everything about us from our car, our picture, how many years we've been on the platform, how many trips we have. What do we know about the rider? Not one thing, possibly a fake name called Killer, at three in the morning that I picked up, never, but I, right? And we don't see their picture. We don't know who they are, right? We, all we know is where to pick them up, where to drop them off, right? So there are things to work on, but yeah, I mean, I wouldn't do it, but like Alan said, you know, crappy full-time jobs are literally forcing people to do rideshare or gig work these days. There is more rideshare drivers on the Uber platform today than ever before, why? It's not because of great earnings, it's because their W-2s are not enough, they have gaps to fill, and barriers to entry is very low for gig work. You upload some documents, you're making a couple hundred bucks a week, and then you pay the bills. Let, let's talk about the, the gig workers who may not be doing it on the side. Yeah. Who for them, you know, and it, I, I've been reporting on this a long time, and uh, you know, sometimes drivers will tell me that it is their only yep. source of income, right? And so in that way, Shelly, can you talk about where the fact that Uber, DoorDash, Lyft, Amazon, Target, Walmart classify the drivers and delivery workers as independent contractors, why is that a problem then? Those folks are not getting social security contributions they don't have employer-provided health care coverage. They don't have workers' compensation insurance should they get injured on the job, should they get into a car accident, which is not on comment at all when you're driving 10, 12, 14 hours a day. Um, they are completely on their own for any injuries and damages or deaths that occur as a result of that. Uh, they're not covered by labor protections like anti discrimination anti-discrimination and anti-harassment. If they are mistreated or abused on the job by a customer, there's nowhere to turn. Mm -hmm. If they are deactivated, taken off an app for no reason, there is nowhere to turn and nothing to protect them. Uh, and that is taking all of the risks of business that any business has and putting it entirely on the shoulders of those workers with, without whom the businesses couldn't exist. Right. Right, and so I feel like we've pretty much laid out the issues, the problems, the concerns with, you know, specifically with app-based gig platform work, but also with some, you know, with other jobs, right? Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about what municipalities and states and activists, um, labor organizers, what everyone's trying to do about this, right? So, I, you know, Sergio, I, I wanna start with you because, you know, you do this, you do advocacy for drivers, but at the same time, um, you know, I, I feel like you, you agree with many drivers who want to stay independent. Yeah. Right? So can you tell me what, what do you see as working then? What is, what is the, the happy middle? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, the happy middle right now seems to be that uh, legislators have to get involved. Mm -hmm. And um, like we're seeing it happen. Uh, I mean, there is a working model, right Seattle. or wrong, Seattle, Washington State. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, it's the best model in the country, but then, you know, companies say something else. That's, that's not the Let, point. Let's talk about, can you explain a little bit what Seattle okay, Seattle, doing? there was a group of drivers in Seattle. Uh, they created a union, not your traditional union, called Washington Drivers mm -hmm. Union. They've, they went to Teamsters, which is a traditional union, and through their contacts, they went and had the ear of the Seattle City Council, and they started discussions, and they passed themselves the highest rates in the country, and at the moment, the only thing they gave up, Levy, was that um, they gave up their collective bargaining rights and traditional unionization rights. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, Seattle package as a driver 
as a rideshare driver, they just passed the delivery driver ordinance, which right. is not looking that good at the moment because I think they're two different businesses. I think rideshare could handle some sort of higher fares, but the deliveries is not, but different story. So they have about 70% of employment rights. They have, you know, um, sick time pay, pay time off, sick leave, a lot of the things that come with the traditional employment, W-2s. Mm -hmm. And they stayed independent contractors because they told the companies what the companies want. The companies want the drivers to stay independent contractors. They say, look, we cannot handle six and a half million employees overnight. Right, and, and, Lyft, and Bo Lyft and Uber were on board with this. Absolutely, ordinance, right? absolutely they came to So now it's happening in the city of Minneapolis. We know the ordinance was passed. Mayor, as promised, vetoed it. And now there's an override veto tomorrow, people, at 1 p.m. Minneapolis time. So you guys keep in track of that. Because I spoke to Malta today, and it looks pretty good. Um, so then there is, an, there is a legislation in Chicago. There's mm -hmm. legislation in Connecticut. There's legislation in Massachusetts. I mean, look, city by city. All these, all, yeah, Denver, in fact, uh, I was, I, I, uh, <laughs> I uh, interviewed Senator Priola about two weeks ago on our channel, and who was the senator who killed the bill, and he's a Democrat, right? There was a transparency bill brought by Stephanie Vigil, who was a House member, mm -hmm. who was a DoorDash driver for herself right. for three years, mm -hmm. and she became door-to-door -door <laughs> grassroots campaign and became a House member, and she brought it, immediately she brought a transparency bill for gig, gig workers. Senator Priola, who was a Democratic senator, killed a bill in the committee. I was in Denver six months ago. I met Senator Priola in person. I spoke to him, turned my app on, showed all these problems, and he listened. And guess who is the leading sponsor in the Senate in Colorado for the transparency bill this year? Right. It's Senator Priola, right? So these people don't know, legislators don't know what to do. Sometimes the best laws they write are actually going to hurt the gig workers. So that's why we think listening to us and come to the table, talk to us. We just don't want you to disappear. I think Uber and Lyft and DoorDash and Grubhub do great things, put a lot of money in drivers' pockets, right? But the fact that Uber, DoorDash, Lyft, et cetera, are trying to avoid uh, you know, I think they like that there's a patchwork of laws, yes. right? Because yes. it works to their advantage. Yeah. But I, I, one thing I wanted to ask Alan, um, how has the proposed legislation or ordinances or rules um, around app-based platform work, how has that affected other freelance work. I mean, we've seen it here in California, and believe me, I got, I got a lot of hate mail when I started writing about AB5. So, um, yeah, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I wanted uh, to address something Sergio said and then yeah. sort of put in, sure. uh, add in uh, a bit of what I see for my company. Uh, I do agree that regulators have to learn what works mm -hmm. um, from different municipalities. I think regulators have really two ends. They need to serve the worker and make sure the worker is safe and secure. Um, Rideshare also helps with transportation, generally yep. speaking. Right, like Rideshare helps with filling gaps that uh, transportation structures Absolutely. don't do. So uh, regulators have to actually serve two, two ends. Uh, all stakeholders have to be listened to and right. have to be served. I mean, I know our, my gig community, we listen to them, but I want to listen to the rider community. I want to, you know, people right. need these services. I mean, I understand all, all yeah. parts of the problem and I agree with them. A lot of hourly workers don't have cars, reliable yep. transportation, it's I hard agree. to get to work on time. Uh, so these are important services. Um, from the perspective of uh, our job seekers, uh, minimum wage changes mm -hmm. are, are not dissimilar from some of these regulations that we talk about with gig. Um, a lot of feedback was uh, these wouldn't work because it would hurt demand and hurt businesses. Right. Um, that's been proven not to be true. Mm -hmm. um, now there's also much more transparency around job postings. Um, so 22 or uh, several municipalities, uh, California, Colorado, New York City, um, what we're seeing is companies actually give very broad spans um, to describe how much... Oh, pay uh, transparency laws? That's uh -huh. right, that's right. 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 Mm -hmm. um, and so like, I, I see patterns between um, the transparency that gig workers want, um, how regulations are being built, but also these traditional questions about uh, what workers deserve to see with jobs in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually see that a, a big connection between the laws that are happening in terms of job postings and some of the things that we're talking about with gig regulations. Mm -hmm. Shelly, what do you see that you think is improving things so far for gig 
workers, um, specifically app-based mm -hmm. platform workers? Yeah, I think Sergio has it right here that the solutions are in the minds and experiences of the people doing the work. And we see a lot of kind of high-level people in power conversations, a lot of them specifically on classification, a few other issues, and little changes in the day-to-day -day lives of people. When we bring these people together and listen and engage and make sure that people who are in positions of political power are able to and incentivized to listen to them, then that's where solutions come from, like raising a pay floor, like having meaningful, substantial benefits, not a couple cents here or a couple cents there, but real access to health insurance, real access to parental paid leave, real access to workers' compensation. These are the things that make a difference in people's lives and aren't just political conversations, but real solutions. And those are the things that the big gig companies are trying to fight not to have to provide to workers, right? So I think we probably up here all agree, though, that workers need those things. So um, I, I want to ask um, anyone on the panel, really, what do you think labor unions' role in all this is? Because typically, that's what unions have fought for, those things that you just said. Um, uh, Shelly, and then Sergio, Alan, whoever. Sure. Yeah, I think you know, labor unions have, for decades, been the center of worker power in this country uh, because they are driven by workers and amplifying those workers' voices. Just like the politicians need to listen to the people doing the work, so do the labor unions. And when those solutions and ideas are rooted in the experiences of the people doing the work, not the people leading the organizations, not the people in you know, offices in DC, but the people in cars and bikes and whatever they're using to deliver the food and drive people around, you know, that's where the solutions lie and that's who the labor unions and the politicians need to be listening to. Now, Sergio, I know that there are some drivers who want to join yeah. a union and there are some who don't. Um, yeah. Where do you fall and, and what do you... What do you um, see as the union's role? Yeah, I mean, a, as a union role, I mean, obviously this year we had two major settlements, right? Because of unions and um, screen actors uh, and writers guild, right? They were on strike for months, mm -hmm. but then they came to a, a beneficial conclusion for themselves and as, as well as UPS, mm -hmm. right? right? I mean, there was a UPS driver who put up his paycheck. People couldn't believe how much money the guy's making, right? So, you know, on the last subject, by the way, as a gig worker, I don't want them to give me those benefits, but pay me enough that I can manage my own budget. Mm -hmm. If you don't pay me enough, if you pay me $20 an hour through your algorithms before my expenses, I have no room. That's when I'm going to ask you for, my, for, your, for employee rights that come with regular W-2s. Mm -hmm. If you pay me 30, 35 bucks an hour gross and I take my expenses out and I run it as a, my business, I have room to buy my own health care. I have room to do these things. But when you algorithmically keep squeezing my pay, then that's what I'm going to ask. And through unions, as you, you, you brought that up, they had those two victories for regular work, right? Employees. Well, on the 14th, of on Valentine's Day, there was a massive national, I'm not going to call it a strike because strikes don't work, but there was a protest. And I was at the LA Uber hub protesting with the rideshare drivers united there, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the voices are growing louder and then the companies know this, right? And there's an avalanche of legislation. Some are good, some are not good, that's coming. And why not just come to the table and talk to your stakeholders, all of them, legislators, writers, drivers. You're saying that the companies should the do The companies, yeah. absolutely. Don't, why, why are we here? We are not here because we want to be here. We want to just work and make our money and flexibly and freedom, all the wonderful things that initially it was there. Mm -hmm. Well, now it's not, and now unions are coming into play. Ultimately, I'm not a huge union fan, but if it's, and I'm not a huge government fan, so flat out, because I don't, you know, <laughs> but, but at some point, 
At some point, the pendulum has swung so far now towards the gig company's way that this is the necessity, and you know, I'm for it now. Alan, I wanted to ask you as someone who used to work for Uber and Lyft, um, how well, has your, <laughs> how, you know, I mean, how, how has your thinking changed, if it has, about, um, you know, how the companies treat its workers? When I worked at Uber and Lyft, um, I, I connected with what she my team connected with what Shelley said. The platform does not work without drivers. Mm -hmm. um, and so I agree with everything that ev has been said. Um, listening to the driver, having their voice be upfront, um, actually driving, uh, experiencing the app, experiencing what it's like to have a passenger uh, in your car, going to a restaurant, struggling with parking, all those challenges um, was really important. I think the benefit of listening is it actually makes the product and the company a lot more successful, mm -hmm. right? There's an incredible incentive for these companies to invest in these conversations. That's what's so great about your work um, is that it's helping drivers, um, but it's also helping the entire system as well. Yeah, I appreciate it. And I think, you know, I think what Alan is saying, you know, when he was at Uber and Lyft, um, he's a good guy, so don't hate him. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, but um, no, I mean, look, the companies have, I do understand the company's point of view, okay? They have their public companies, they have fiduciary responsibilities to their shareholders. They gotta be profitable. But on the other hand, I mean, raise the hands, right? No drivers, there is no Uber. I mean, you can push all the buttons you want. You can push the button, food shows up. You can push the button, car show up to take you to the airport. You can push the button, a dog walker will show up, okay? There's an app for everything today. But without me, picking you up, or your food up, or your groceries up. There is no Instacart, there is no Uber, there is no Lyft. So I just want to build this bridge. I just want these people to understand. Put yourselves in my shoes. You know, I even put out a challenge actually last week on our channel. I said to CEOs of the companies and all the employees, 40,000 between the two of them. I said, why don't you donate your salary for one month, one single month, uh -huh. to a fallen victim of rideshare violence with my pressure, go do ride share for a whole month, not this PR thing with the little picture on the Wall Street Journal. Look, I'm driving, I'm learning. I'm like, bro, you're not learning anything. <laughs> the, I mean, Dara Koshoshai last year did Uber Eats in San Francisco, almost got run over, and he got tip baited. Mm -hmm. There is still tip baiting on Uber Eats. What did you learn? Nothing. But anyway, so the point I'm trying to make is let's build this bridge, let's sit at the table, let's talk, common sense. And that's what we want, and hopefully we'll get there. I, I, I want to ask, what is it that gets the companies, the big app companies, to take action? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I worked at both companies for six years. I saw, I had a lot of conversations with drivers. I've seen a lot of driver actions on, on both sides um, for both companies. Um, yeah, I mean, but I, I think what would surprise you is that literally the feedback did matter. Um, and no, it doesn't um, surprise me. I, I yeah. know it does, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of people, engineers and product managers and, and senior leaders that actually do want to make, I, I think they have the perspective that drivers actually are customers. Um, obviously, things need to be much better, and there needs to be faster improvement. Um, but a lot of people within the companies do have this approach that drivers matter a lot and their earnings matter a lot. Yeah. I mean, look, I look at Uber and Lyft, or especially at Uber. I mean, they're the big gorilla here. Right. right. And I look at them, you know, if anybody knows Marina Del Rey in L.A., I look at them as a huge oil tanker, right, <laughs> you know, in the marina. If they want to turn fast, they're going to hit every million-dollar boat around, and they can't do that. I do respect that. I do understand that. That's why I'm putting myself in their shoes. But you said... What will make it change, right? Okay, maybe protests will make it make a difference. Maybe keeping it in the media for the next, I don't know how long, will make a difference. So, look, there are a lot of things we can do. I just want to start the dialogue. I want them to learn from us, and I, we, we're certainly learning from them. And I'm willing to d create this bridge. I really am. And then if the CEOs are watching today, you know, I'm here. You know where, where to find me. And I'm going to do it as long as I can. And, and I'm going to fight for rights and better pay, better safety, better, you know, unju less unjust deactivations. And hopefully we'll get somewhere before I quit. <laughs> Shelly, I wanted to ask you, you know, um, because there is this pattern, you know, it's not just 
Uber and DoorDash and Lyft and Instacart anymore, right? Like, because Amazon is a hugely profitable company, yep. but, you know, it is contracting out its, its deliveries, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, there is a pattern of the gig gigification of almost everything. So, can you talk about how important it is that, you know, for not just for workers, but the customers that use these apps, right? That workers have decent working conditions and pay. Like how, you know, why is that important to all of us? Yeah, so when we talk about the, the gigification of work, we need to ask, what does that mean? What does it mean to be gigified? If we mean, let's take new technologies and use them to match people to jobs and jobs to customers, that sounds great. Let's do it. Let's gigify things. But if we mean let's lower working conditions, let's reduce security, let's strip people of their benefits, let's put all the risks on them, that is a problem. And that is a problem that we see through gigification and more broadly in the economy, as we've talked about. W-2 employment job quality has declined. Wages have stagnated. Workers are less likely to, provide, to get, receive benefits no matter how they work. Combined with rising costs of housing, of education, of health care, work doesn't pay for what it needs to pay for, for gig workers and all workers. And so when we think about solutions, we need to think about things that make work better because workers are what power the economy through an app or not. Uh, we just, the Workers Lab this week released a new report based on participatory research with gig workers broadly defined, so app-based workers as well as folks working under the table, domestic workers, people outside of long-term permanent direct hire employment. And the, the resounding message was just make it better, make these jobs pay, let people live. I mean, just, sorry, you go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to add to that. Uh, one of our, uh, a bit of our vision at gigs is to al allow more conversations about jobs before you apply to a job. Mm -hmm. So someone that's been in that experience, what's the training like? What's the onboarding like? What are the conditions like? Um, how many hours can you actually expect in a job? Um, what are growth opportunities? Uh, what's a promotion like? Um, and that's part of the vo giving the worker a voice, um, but also helping the broader worker community by adding more transparency to the job before you even apply to it. Um, so that's a big part of our, our product arc that we're gonna be bringing to job seekers. That sounds good. Um, I, I think we are going to turn to audience questions. Uh, for our in-house audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to line up right over here. Uh, but we'll go ahead and kick off questions from uh, our online audience via YouTube. Why do these tech companies need to undermine workers to get paid? What is the future of tech companies when they need workers in order to be a trillion dollar company? That's a great question. Um, who wants to take that there of a question? I, I repeat the question one more time. I was just watching the driver go there. Say it again. Sorry. Why do tech companies need to undermine workers to get paid? What is the future of tech companies when they need workers in order to be a trillion dollar company? Yeah. Uh, why do they need workers? I mean, somebody's got to pick up that passenger still and you know as much as we know AI and robotics and autonomous vehicles and all this good stuff that's coming around. I was in a Waymo two weeks ago in LA. I think it drove better than me to be honest with you guys, right? So it's coming, right? The replacement, our replacement is coming. Why do they need it? Automation gets rid of the biggest cost for these companies. The companies looks at the driver, look at the driver as their biggest cost, which is true. Half of the what they collect from the passenger goes to the driver. If you can replace that cost, that's how you become a trillion dollar company. So we're just a cost to be replaced. But again, you know, hope, hope is alive. Uh, you know, somebody's still today anyway, got to do the work. So, and we're here to do the work, but we want to get paid fairly and treated fairly. Our next question comes from someone in our in-person audience. 
Uh, hi, I have a lot of thoughts and questions, but I'll get um, straight to one. Um, my name is Hannah um, Zuckerman. I work at um, eBase, um, which is um, here tonight, um, partnering with Zocalo or, or here on with Zocalo. Um, and I worked. A, I sometimes do DoorDash to supplement my own, you know, pay. I was unemployed for a few months, so did DoorDash. So I'm here as you know a, a gig worker. Um, one of my my thoughts, um, kind of two questions I have is. The idea of kind of maybe potentially setting your own pay rate as a gig worker, right? Sergio, you talked about, you know, setting salaries to cover all of those things as a freelancer, right? Freelancers have a rate that covers all of these things that traditional employers would cover. Um, so wondering if that's, you know, a thought for potentially doing that, right? Dog walkers set their own rate on, on Rover. Um, the other thing is, I've been thinking a lot about this over the years, is how a lot of folks might drop out of the traditional workforce to work full time in a gig economy job. Maybe that's because they are working, they found that work and then just kind of give up on finding other traditional work or this is flexible. So I just want to kind of, I don't know if there's a question in that per se, but but see what your thoughts on are on kind of that that rate of, of folks who do that. I mean, on your first part of your questions, as far as setting our own rates, um, I think it should be just uh, a no-brainer, right? I mean, look, I have a lot of friends who are plumbers, in, 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 in air conditioning contractors, electricians. They set their own rates. They go to a job, they put a bid in. If the bid is too high, the next guy is going to get the job, but you're going to learn and you're going to eventually adjust, right? So, you know, if you personally ask me, do I, do I, am I an independent contractor? I, in the true sense of being an independent contractor, setting my own rates, adjusting my costs, right? You know, my costs have gone up to operate a car over the last four years by 40 to 60 percent. Well, I wouldn't do the same trip I was doing three years ago, four years ago for the same price that I'm doing today, but we don't have that power. So I don't consider myself an independent contractor as far as turning the app on when I want and turning it off when I want. And uh, as far as, you know, that would be awesome. Actually, we had that in California when AB5 passed and when Uber and Lyft completely ignored it for nine months. We could set our own rates through a multiplier, uh, you know, on our, on our apps. Hey, went away and they passed Prop 22. I think, I think it's a great idea. I think, uh, you know, I, I'd be all for that. But I don't know how it would work with large scale businesses they are. I mean, Uber did 2.7 billion trips last quarter. I don't know how that will work individually, this, this thing, but I'm all for it, yeah. And, and there have been other rideshare companies that I think allow yeah. drivers to set their own prices in the past. Yeah. Well, there's a company called InDrive that's around the globe. That's actually a P2P kind of a s company. Actually, there's no algorithms, there's no hocus pocus, there's none of the stuff that's happening, you know? And then the customer says, yes, we go do the job, but yeah. Our next in-person audio <coughs> question comes from David Trilling, um, I, I have a five-second question and, and then a, a little bit more detailed question. The first one is, um, how does the minimum wage uh, affect the, the various folks that we're talking about? Um, and then secondly is, if, if you're a cab driver, say from the old days, how does your life <coughs> compare with, I mean, what, what, what's your life like versus what the life is like of, of the drivers that we're talking about? Thank you. Well, I wasn't a cab driver. I, uh, I, I have a cab driver friend here who was a cab driver. Now he's... Uh, eight, nine year Uber driver, right? And he can probably talk about it. Uh, he can answer that, how the differences were. Um, and, and as far as minimum wage, um, look, we have, I'm from California, obviously. We have Proposition 22, and now in New York State, there is a so-called minimum wage <laughs> floor being set. A lot of these things are brought upon by these companies, right? They, pa they spent $250 million in California to pass Proposition 22. Um, if it wasn't favorable to them, I don't think they would have done it. And the way the law is written is it literally eliminates probably 80 to 85 percent of the workforce because you don't drive enough hours to gain all the benefits or the minimum wage. So to me, you know, these laws, when they're coming around, you know, with Prop 22 clones around the country now as a nationwide thing, I'm not a huge friend of it, but it has its, you know, it has its limits. I, I personally don't think we should even be talking about minimum wage when we're doing rideshare. It's a dangerous job. I mean, my risk reward has to be commensurate with my pay. My risk is very high. I mean, I'm picking up 30 people. This guy can stab me in the neck on the next trip. 
And if I want to work for a minimum wage, I might as well go flip burgers. I don't want to do ride share. And that's what I tell you know, to the drivers I talk to all the time. I was going to say with, with taxis also, I think the passenger experience is, is somewhat different. And I think that for some municipalities, the medallion expense was also significant. So there is like a, a big upfront cost, potentially debt, um, and more of a commitment because you're, you're paying that, that debt. Uh, and so it's, uh, in terms of flexibility, I think there also is a material difference in some cities between rideshare and, and taxi. And I will say that I've interviewed many, many drivers, Uber and Lyft drivers who used to be yeah. taxi drivers. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Our next in-person audience comes from? Sanja. Um, so we started off this conversation highlighting how the tech has, like the algorithms and everything have enabled um, all these uh, gig economies to change the way they have. But what, throughout the conversation, we've also highlighted how legislation has enabled it. And we've also highlighted how we have used uh, legislation to push back against it. But are there some ways that individuals can use some of the tech um, kind of against itself? Yeah, difficult, very difficult. Um, these algos are written city by city, literally hour by hour, because I study them, right? And then uh, I try to figure it out, and I still believe that the human brain is the best algo, <laughs> but um, it's becoming, they're so sophisticated these days, and Alan, I'm pretty sure, knows. And from his days to today, I'm sure they have improved so much more. And um, I mean, look, uh, algorithms, actually, the reason I started doing right here was because I was researching a book I'm writing the, the effects of algorithms on the human race in general, not just rideshare or gig work, right? And look where we are, right? Everything in the human race now today is algorithms. You know, your FICO score is going to be on an algorithm pretty soon. Your, your ability to buy a house or get a job will be on an algorithm. So to fight back through algos of our own, I, I, I don't know. I, I wanted to ask, are you asking that because you know drivers or delivery workers who try to game the system? From the, just from listening to the conversation, that just yeah. kind of came to mind. Right. Anti-algo <laughs> algorithms. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't know. I mean, look, I know all the tricks when it comes to all the all the tricks, Ill, good, legal and illegal ones. And you know, I'm telling you, it's it's not easy to deal with these algos. They're just they're just too good. And we have talked a lot about the big players, the Ubers, the DoorDashes, the Lyfts. There are other uses of technology in these technologies, like worker-owned cooperatives, drivers' yeah. cooperative, that provide a different model, that do put the ownership of the technology in the hands of the drivers. Yeah. Yeah. Many in-person audience questions here, so we'll move on to our next one. My name is Alex Popovics. Um, I want to thank um, the James Irvine Foundation, Zocalo, for this opportunity. Sergio is a, a hero of mine. Okay. I have been driving for a living in San Francisco for 42 years, but I was very moved by Shelley's expertise because I came here with a question in regard to labor laws. The labor laws, as I understand, that we are based today were created in 1930, uh, almost a century ago, and they were updated between 1944, 47 to the independent contractor formula. We just had the, the ruling of the Labor Department that concerns me. I've been an employer uh, for 27 years and an independent contractor during that period. I've been driving rideshare now for six since I closed my business. And I think that's a, a known fact that the greatest thing about the so-called gig economy that um, you explained independent contractor existed, you know, forever, is the flexibility. And uh, from what I understand from Sergio's and rideshare surveys and most media outlets, the great majority of uh, rideshare drivers, which is what I do, um, <coughs> would prefer to, be, to stay as an independent contractor. And a lot of people talk about this possibility of legislators to come up with a hybrid format where kind of like you have in Seattle where Maybe you have workers' comp protection, but at the same time, the flexibility. So with your expertise, I wanted to, to know what you think the future will be, because I couldn't fathom punching a clock. 
so the, the future will be what people make it. There's not a set path. What people, what workers want and need is agency. They want agency over their time to decide when they can work, to balance their work with other commitments. You don't have agency if you're making $6 an hour. You don't have agency if you don't know whether or not there's going to be shifts available. So we often hear that flexibility is a trade-off for financial stability. And well, do you want flexibility and independence or stability and being tied down? That's not a trade-off. There is room for good jobs that have stability and agency. Some of those fall under independent contracting. Some of those fall under employment. But we can't give up one to have the other. We need to keep working towards both for everyone. Thank you. I mean, if you, if you think about it, it's really an opportunity for the gig companies to innovate to that fastest. If you're, if you're the best platform for drivers, and if you look at drivers as your customer, yeah. that, that's going to give you a significant edge. And I still think there's room for that kind of innovation as well. Absolutely. I 100% agree with that. Yeah. I mean, you know, gig companies do enough, but the, the, the problem that I see is the transitory um, fact that exists that most gig workers are on platforms for about eight months or less. Right. And they quit for one reason or another. It could be good reasons, bad reasons. They got another job. They may, be, they may have been doing it in between two W2s. Uh, that's the problem. Right, but you know, you had to ask like halfway through. You said, "What about those full timers?" Mm -hmm. I mean, I know Alex is a full timer, and he's been doing it for very successfully in San Francisco for six years, right? And he would—he loves his flexibility, and he makes decent money. I mean, he's he, he decreased over the over the years, obviously, but like Shelley said, at what are we exchanging here? Right? Should we exchange our flexibility and so-called flexibility and freedom for lower earnings where we cannot even take care of, of our own stuff? No, it shouldn't be like that. But, I mean, um, yeah, I, you know, the, I, I personally think, you know, these, these full, t you know, I talk to these companies quite a bit, and Alan maybe agrees with me on this one. They tell me 20% of drivers do 80% of the trips. And 80% of part-timers do 20% of the trips. They're not concerned about the soccer mom who's going to drop the kids off and do 10 trips a week right. between before they pick him up. But Alex is the one that's doing the work. And I think he should get paid differently. He should get treated differently by these companies. I, that's one thing I wanted to say. Instacart used to have a hybrid model. They had people they, they paid as employees, yeah. or they considered employees, and then they had shoppers who were independent contractors. They've moved away from that they now. Do, yeah. I, I just wonder, like, you know, whether that could be one of the happy mediums. I um, mean, potentially, yes, but, but I think full-time rideshare gig workers, there are 20% of it, so 6 million Uber drivers, 20% is a lot, it's a million plus people. I think they need more rights. I think they need more protections as far as health care. Look, they're doing it for full time. They shouldn't be treated the same as a guy that just signed on on the system with a huge bonus who's going to just grab the bonus and go. And that's what I don't understand. I mean, Alan was inside, and I'm kind of inside now. I kind of tried to figure this out. I don't get it that, you know, the marketing cost to onboard a driver right, right now in L.A., Lyft is paying me a thousand dollars referral to me to refer a Lyft driver, and it paying Lyft and paying the driver six hundred and seventy dollars. That's seventeen hundred dollars they're putting out to onboard a new fresh blood because somebody quit, right? Okay, markets are already oversaturated. Why don't you pay that to an existing full timer through bonuses or through some incentives? So they, you know, pay the, your, your full-timers a little bit more. And Can you ask them this tomorrow? I am going to ask them. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. I am going to ask them. <laughs> I go, what kind of marketing is this that you spend all these hundreds of millions of dollars to onboard fresh blood, and then they quit in six months, or they take the bonus in six weeks, they're gone, and the money is burnt, like you're literally putting money on fire. Just keep that money and pay your, you know, full-timers a little bit more. We'll be taking one more audience question after this one, but please be sure you stick around for our reception where we encourage you to talk to one another as well as the panelists. Hi, I am uh, Ivan with Gig Workers Rising. We are a big uh, driving group here in the Bay Area covering uh, San Jose, here in Oakland, 
San Francisco, even even Sacramento. So uh, we have over a thousand drivers and growing uh, every day in our in our group. And we were the ones that were down uh, right at the uh, Uber uh, headquarters this uh, on, uh, on Valentine's Day on the 14th. So we had about, you know, three, four hundred cars circling around asking the CEOs to come out and just talk to us, right? And just say, hey, you know, we, we want to communicate, right? Obviously, they didn't come down, but that's all right. But uh, we're, we're going to be back again because April Fool's is coming up. And, you know, April Fool's, we're no fools. You know, we know how to do math, right? We know how to do some things. So we're going to be back there April the 1st and, you know, see, see what happens. He would get some attention in the media. But my question really is uh, to Sergio. Uh, Sergio, one of the big things that our drivers fight for, as you know, you know, we, we've got the issue, you know, with the pay, we've got deactivations, but... I really felt, when I really thought about it, you know, what, what is the easiest thing for these, these Lyft companies that they could possibly come to the table with and agree on? Because they already have the technology, it already exists. I had to use this technology when I signed up. I had to do a background check. Yep. I had to give out my license. I had to give out information of where I live, yep. my phone number, my email. I mean, everything, all my car information. I yep. mean, there's no way I can hide. It's impossible. Yep. <laughs> so my question to you is, Sergio, why is it so hard after year after year after year with literally drivers dying? How many more drivers have to die for these companies to really fight and, 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 and give us the actual safety we need for a thing that already exists? Give them a background check. How many background checks of these people that, yeah. that you know, yeah, I mean, the cars of these people, if they didn't pass that check, they wouldn't have gone. That driver would still be alive I, today. I, look, I, just, that's I, I can go on about that for like hours, but the quick answer is, there is only, there's about three and a half million drivers on the Uber system in the U.S., about a million on Lyft, maybe a little bit more now. Um, then there is 150 MAPCs, that Uber calls it on their earnings report, monthly active paying customer, or they used to be MAUs, monthly active users. They change the acronym every month to confuse me, probably, or the analyst <laughs> community. I'm going like, why do we need all these things, man? It's just customers. Anyway, long story short, there's 150 million customers. I call the customer the golden goose that lays the golden egg. There is not a chance on the planet that these gig companies will run 150 million people, imagine the cost of that, through a background check, because if they did, they, would ha they wouldn't even have half the customers that they have now, right? So, but I do agree with you, right? The reason crime has risen, and obviously social reasons, whatever, crime is crime, crime can find you anywhere, um, but the reason it has gone up is because I know this for a fact, like this morning, okay, I ordered a chip from Burbank, Airport, I mean, from my house to Burbank Airport, right? It showed up. Driver's name was Ali. His license plate, how many years on the platform, his eye color. The only thing I didn't know was underwear color was he, you know, he had. I'm going like, okay, I know everything about this customer. And I knew about his car. Literally, if you're a criminal and you onboarded the system with some fake ID and some debit card, right? You can go, and the customer has two minutes, by the way, to cancel a trip without charge. You can literally go shuffle through drivers with the car, exact car you want to carjack, and literally call the victim to you. All we want as drivers is, how about this? As a, as a rider, upload a government-given ID to you. How about that? We do that. We did it with our driver's license. It doesn't have to be their driver's license. Any picture ID. Let me see your face before I come pick you up. Right? That will solve a lot of problems. And if you can't provide that, then you get booted. You get deactivated off the system. Let's start there. Asking for a background check, that's not going to happen. Our last audience question comes from... Hello, my name is Evan Cambridge. I'm a Democratic presidential candidate, and I probably have more experience with rideshare than anyone here. Uh, I started ride-sharing with Lyft in 2013 under the donation system. I have a ballot initiative in uh, the state legislative council's office. 70% uh, of all ride revenue would go to the driver, uh, excluding um, tolls. So tolls wouldn't be a part of that 70%. It's actually in the state legislative uh, office right now. They're working on it. I already got the 25 signatures. It's going to go to the secretary of state's office. I'm going to need your help. Uh, it's about $2,000 uh, to, to pay for the bill, and I'm going to need your help to get the 500,000 signatures to get it on the ballot. But everyone's asking the question about how do we work as being a contractor and still mandate we get the certain amount of money. 
Uber's winning because the algorithm um, makes sure to extract the most amount of money on long rides. On short rides, you get a higher percentage. On longer rides, they cut you to like 50%. If you mandate that uh, you get 70%, what would you think about that, sir? Thank you. 70% of the fare? Okay, well, yes, look. Uh, excluding tolls. So toll. I got you. Excluding tolls and tips, right? So, um, seventy percent of the fare. Actually, Lyft did just announce that, right, about a month ago, with the Hocus Pocus seventy thirty guarantee that they they announced, which I'm going to talk to them about tomorrow. Um, that's after external estimated external expenses, and uh, that's not seventy thirty, right? So seventy thirty, the way I figured it is this: customer pays ten, I get seven, Lyft gets three, or Uber gets three. What Lyft is doing now is they go, okay, here's what we're going to do. Customer pay 10. Our external expenses, which are variable, estimated, could be three. So we take the three out of the 10, and now we're left with seven. After that seven, we get the 70-30 cut. So I'm going like, that's a bunch of hocus pocus, man. It didn't work. My math is pretty good. It didn't work. So with your 70-30, actually, there's a company. I don't know where you are now. Uh, there's a company called, okay, there's a company called InDrive in Miami. They're the most downloaded app in the, on the planet at the moment. They're in 650 cities. They're pretty strong. They're in Miami. They have exactly that, meaning customer paid 10. We take 30%. The rest is yours, buddy. That's when, go check them out. It's going to be called InDrive. I, I would help you with it if you like, but you know, um, having dealt with these people, it's not that easy. <laughs> I got you. I got you. I got you. All right. Well, that was a lively conversation. <laughs> Thanks. Focus, focus. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, Sergio. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Levy. Thank you, Shelly. This was great. Um, thank you to everyone for showing up. I just want to remind everyone this program was part of Zocalo's series. What is a good job now? Supported by the James Irvine Foundation. Please visit Zocalo's website for more programs in this series, plus a summary of each program and interviews with our panelists. Please subscribe to Zocalo's newsletter, podcast, and social media for more great conversations like this one. We encourage our in person audience to stay and continue the conversation. Um, for about an hour. Um, we have light bites and beverages. And um, I just want to thank everyone again. Please give our guests another round of applause. Thank you.